Hi, everybody. This is Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio. We have Peter Schiff. Uh, always a great pleasure to talk to. He's the CEO of Euro Pacific Capital, Europac, E-U-R-O-P-A-C.com, and the chairman of Schiff Gold, and, of course, a frequent media commentator who regularly blows the minds of these sm- smarmy leftists who inhabit the mainstream uh, media. Hey, Peter, good to chat with you again. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks to, for having me on. You know, I'm not on nearly as frequently as I used to be. You know, they 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 don't they don't they don't like to bring me on as much. Uh, maybe they want to deny uh, some of the things that I'm saying because I, I point out some things that are very unpleasant. Well, tragically, you're the kind of guy they'll have on afterwards, and they'll say, "So you were right." But they won't say oh, no, ahead they, of time. They, uh, they, they probably won't give me credit for being right, but they'll have me on. <laughs> but they, they rarely give you credit. But a lot of people are making fun of me. A lot of articles are pointing out, you know, because my gold predictions, right? Oh, gold 2,000, gold 5,000. And, you know, now gold's below 1,100. And they want to say, oh, you know, Peter Schiff doesn't know what he's talking about. But meanwhile, all those people have been bearish on gold from 300 to 1900. Somehow they're geniuses because the gold price has finally gone down. You know, just because a bunch of fools don't understand what the problems are, they think the Fed has solved the problems, they don't understand that they've made the problems worse, that doesn't, you know, undercut anything that I've been saying just because it's taking a little bit longer for this next leg of the gold bull market. But, you know, they don't waste any time taking pot shots at me. Okay, so so let's, because the libertarians have been talking about uh, gold and the need to buy gold because of the expectation of hyperinflation for, for many, many years. And I'm pretty aware that this is not even a dead cat bounce. Like, this is not even a pseudo recovery. Uh, there is a lot of smoke and mirrors going on. But I wonder if you can talk about why it is that people think that Obama, who's presided over, I think, as you've pointed out, a recession during his entire pregnancy, uh, his entire presidency. Why, um, why do people think that there's this recovery, that everything's back to normal, when, of course, the debt is still growing, when there's still 0% roughly interest rates, uh, the Fed is afraid to raise the rates. And also, of course, there's been continuous quantitative easing or what used to be called counterfeiting. Uh, Why are people unable to see any of this stuff? Is it because they just don't have a clue about the theory? You know, why couldn't they see the 2008 financial crisis when it was lurking right around the corner? You know, why did uh, Ben Bernanke in mid-2008 not have a recession anywhere in his forecasts even though we were already in one. We had been in the Great Recession for seven months, and he was looking around and saying everything looks great. I mean, even at the peak of the housing bubble, they said it didn't exist. Uh, so these are the same people. So it shouldn't be a surprise that they can't see this crisis when they couldn't see the last one. And then when it happened, they said, well, you know, nobody could have possibly seen this coming. This was impossible to predict, even though there were people like me who were warning about it for years and they were dismissing those warnings. And in fact, even after we were right, they said, oh, well, they're just a stop clock. They don't really know anything anyway. Uh, you know, they were talking about this for years. Yes, because the problems were obvious for years. They were just in denial. And I think it's all part of the same problem that they still don't understand. I think right now the bubble is bigger than ever. The Fed has spent seven years blowing more air into it than it's ever blown into any bubble in the past. We've had interest rates at zero. Not just low interest rates. Alan Greenspan brought them down to 1% for a while. We're talking about zero. We're talking about giving it away for seven years. We're talking about three rounds of this quantitative easing where the Fed's balance sheet is now four and a half trillion dollars. I mean, if you imagine, or you don't have to imagine, you think back to all the damage that was done to the economy because of Greenspan's easy money policies that gave us uh, the financial crisis and the Great Recession. Well, imagine how much more damage the Fed has done under Bernanke and Yellen with a much more aggressive monetary policy than even anything uh, Greenspan could have, you know, dreamt about. Imagine all of the damage that's been done over this time period and how it's going to come back to bite us. And, you know, we don't need hyperinflation to benefit as owners of gold. I mean, we haven't had hyperinflation in this country yet. Gold was twenty dollars an ounce, uh, and when when, when uh, Roosevelt confiscated it, it was it was thirty dollars, thirty five dollars an ounce 
up until about 1970. We devalued it a couple of times to 42 before we left the gold standard. But now gold's almost 1100. So gold has gone way up and we haven't had hyperinflation. So even just accelerated inflation is very, very good for gold. Of course, if we have hyperinflation, you better own gold because if all you own is dollars, you have nothing. You have something to line uh, your, your, your birdcage with because if there's hyperinflation, the money's not worth anything. Well, of course, uh, like these Zimbabwe trillion dollar bills, yeah. they can be sold as curiosities of the future. Now, the 0% interest rates, I mean, uh, my audience, I think, it's pretty good, but not as economically sophisticated as yours. And my understanding of 0% interest rates combined with uh, inflation is that the Fed is basically paying people to take its money and they still can't jumpstart any kind of sustainable economic bro growth. That is absolutely catastrophic. It's like paying people, it's like I'll pay you $20 to eat at my restaurant and no one comes to your restaurant. I mean, how yeah. bad does your restaurant have to be? <laughs> Well, first of all, you can't jumpstart economic growth by printing money. If you could, anybody could do it, right? All these banana republics would, would be leading the global economy if printing money was the key to economic success. The reality is what the Fed is doing is actually preventing a real recovery from taking place because what they're doing is they're entrenching all the problems in the economy. They're misdirecting assets, resources, back to parts of the economy where it doesn't belong, and they're preventing those resources from flowing to where they do belong, where we would create real economic growth, increased production, uh, good paying jobs. Instead, we're trying to you know, divert resources to sustaining a stock market bubble, a bond market bubble, a real estate bubble, a consumer spending bubble in automobiles. Uh, we're trying to uh, sustain a government bubble and, and, and preserve all these programs and employees that we can't afford. And in doing that, uh, the government is denying or starving the real economy, the productive sector of the economy, from the resources it needs to grow and preventing the restructuring of our economy that is so desperately needed. We cannot re build a legitimate recovery on this phony foundation of bubbles. We need to get rid of this so we can have a solid foundation to build a lasting recovery. But none of that is happening because the Federal Reserve is standing in the way. And of course, all of the entrenched interests, particularly the financial sector, that is benefiting from all of this nonsense. You know, if you can borrow money at 0%, you don't have to be a business genius <laughs> to make money as a banker. Just go out and buy some bonds. What is the old rule in banking? The 363 rule, you borrow at 3%, you lend at 6%, you go pay golf at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's, I mean, they've yeah. just become ridiculously redundant. And I think it is starving much needed uh, entrepreneurial areas from new capital. Yeah. And, you know, the average person or even the average entrepreneur, he can't borrow at 3%. He can't borrow at all. There's, there's no capital there. It's only the heavily connected banks that can borrow. And what are they doing with their money? Are they growing the economy? Are they making capital investments? No. In fact, if you look at corporate America, there has been such a, a, a collapse in capital investment that the average age of our plant and equipment is the oldest it's been in over 60 years. None of this money is being used productively. It is going to finance share buybacks, which enrich a few, but don't uh, benefit the many. Uh, it is not growing the economy to do this. And, you know, the irony of it is this whole big, you know, divide, the 1%, the 99%, this huge disparity between the super rich and everybody else is growing dramatically under President Obama. I mean, if he wasn't president, he would be the biggest critic of the last, you know, seven years or six years, however long he's been in the White House, uh, because of this huge uh, widening wealth gap, and and they, the Democrats like to talk about it, but they don't expect response, accept responsibility for creating it. Their only solution is raise taxes on the rich. That's not going to help. That's if anything, that's going to make the situation worse. The very wealthy people who are getting all this cheap money. I mean, it doesn't matter what the tax rates are there, uh, you know. But it's the entrepreneur who's going to be impacted. The guy that might actually start a business and hire somebody that's going to be negatively impacted by higher taxes. So you're just going to accelerate. Uh, this this gap between uh, the rich and everybody else. You're not you're not going to solve that problem until you get to the root cause of it. 
Well, and of course, what they will do is hold up the free market as the scapegoat for the right and scapegoat for the widening gap between rich and poor, as if we have much of that left. Across yeah, I the mean, world, if, yeah, if we had a free market, we, this would not be happening. It is not a free market when the Federal Reserve is determining interest rates. That, that's, that's, that's a controlled economy. That's a centrally planned economy. And, you know, the, the way our economy is run is, you know, not different than the way the Soviet Union used to run parts of its economy. We have pockets of freedom. That's why you still see some innovation. But if you look at the areas where the government is most entrenched, education, health care, housing, these are disasters. You know, look what the government has done to the housing market. Uh, home ownership rates now are at the lowest level since like 1967, right? Uh, meanwhile, if you look at the medium cost of a new home, the new homes that we're building, the medium cost is 10 times the medium wage. Back in 1950, it was only two times the medium wage. I mean, so the government set about making housing more affordable and they drove the cost through the roof to the point where nobody can afford it now unless the government loans them all the money on a guaranteed loan. They have no money for a down payment. We've destroyed the education system. We've destroyed the healthcare system. We now have the most expensive college degrees in the world and the most worthless college degrees. We have kids in their 20s living with their parents in their basement because they have a philosophy degree that has no value. Meanwhile, they have enormous student loan payments and their grandparents are still working part-time at Walmart because that's the only way they can survive 0% interest rates and a rising cost of living in this economy. So the people who want to retire are too broke to retire, and the young people can't get jobs. I remember talking years ago with a teacher who was retiring, and that teacher said, oh, the 60s, you know, his eyes went kind of misty, <laughs> and he, oh, the 60s, you know, he was making $9,000 a year as a teacher, and his house cost him eleven five. $11,500. Now, teachers in Toronto are making sort of sixty, seventy thousand, which means it should be eighty, ninety thousand $90,000 for a house. Instead, it's eight or $900,000 for a house. And so we've almost lost that memory of what the economy used to be like and how affordable things used to be. This has become the new normal. And like where, where somehow when people vanish from the workforce, they're considered no longer unemployed. When, when things go up, but the government says they're not, somehow we just look at the numbers rather than the, the, the grocery bill or whatever. This has kind of become the new normal. And I think we've got to try and shake people out. This doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this constant degradation of opportunity. Yeah, and the media likes to make fun of me because I, you know, I deny the government numbers. I don't want to accept how great the economy is because the government tells me how great it is. But meanwhile, what the media or Wall Street is overlooking is what ordinary people are saying that are living in this economy. They don't live in government statistics. They live in reality. And, and their reality is totally different than what the government is pretending and what the media is pretending. And so I would say to the people who are you know, trotting out these government numbers and trying to claim everything is great, why are you drowning out the cries of the people in the real economy? Because that tells a totally different story. You know, they can't buy the CPI. They have to buy actual products, right? And so if the prices of the products they're buying are going up, it doesn't matter what the government pretends. You know, if the government wants to pretend that all everybody has jobs, but the people who are out there and don't have jobs know they're unemployed and the government wants to pretend they don't exist, or you have people who are working part-time and the government says, okay, well, you're employed. Well, they're only working part-time because they can't find a full-time job that they actually want. I mean, that person is still unemployed. You know, if somebody used to be a, a, you know, work work in a factory and maybe he was an engineer and now he's a part time fry cook at McDonald's, that guy's unemployed. But the government wants to pretend that he's not. Or even the people who, who like I remember in the early 90s when I graduated with my undergrad, it was a terrible recession. And I'm like, well, I might as well get my master's, you know. And so a lot of the people <laughs> are heading back to school because there are no jobs. Uh, out there for them. And they're also counted as employed or, or working. The problem is people with master's degrees are waiting tables and driving cabs right now. So if that's the case, why are you going to go to school to get a degree that there's no demand for anyway? I mean, people are wasting their time and taxpayer money, and it's going to be taxpayer money because nobody's going to pay back these loans. And the taxpayers are going to be on the hook, uh, you know, for the unpaid balances.
Uh, well, you see, but because my degree was in history with some aspects in philosophy, Peter, I could see down the tunnel of time. See, that's the thing, <laughs> right? I could see podcasting in, you know, 10 to 12 years, so I'll take a little bit of time in the business world. But no, actually, I mean, I was just very lucky that way. And of course, a lot of these people are graduating without those skills. And across the world, you know, a lot of a lot of people are focusing on Greece because it's very dramatic and there's Molotov cocktails and, and all this kind of stuff. But Boy, you know, I've been trying to draw people's attention recently to Puerto Rico and to China. And I know you've, you've written uh, and, and spoken some about that because I sort of have the feeling it's going to be a little bit more important to Americans that uh, China seems to be facing a bubble crash and uh, Puerto Rico is about to default. Uh, I wonder if you could just step people through how this might actually affect their, their uh, portfolios and their jobs and their lives. Well, first of all, portfolio, I mean, uh, Puerto Rico, I think, is a very uh, interesting uh, example of what happens when governments borrow too much money uh, and are forced to admit they can't repay it, because that's the point that Puerto Rico is in. But the irony of it is Puerto Rico has less debt than America relative to the size of its economy or on a per capita basis, even if you adjust it for the fact that per capita income in Puerto Rico is roughly half of what it is in Mississippi, which I think is the poorest of the U.S. states. But even if you make the relative adjustments, Puerto Rico is fiscally more sound than the United States. The only difference is Puerto Rico's creditors have figured this out and America's creditors have not. So Puerto Rican creditors are demanding much higher interest rates. And so Puerto Rico can't continue to play the game. They can't borrow money at a rate that they can afford. Well, in America, if our creditors all of a sudden decided that we were broke and they refused to roll over their treasuries and demanded that we pay an interest rate as high as what the market is currently demanding Puerto Rico pay, then we would have to make the same admission. We would have to tell our creditors we can't pay. We would have to be asking for bankruptcy or restructuring. We'd be in the exact same predicament. The difference is, though, of course, uh, the federal, the government, U.S. government can rely on the Federal Reserve and Janet Yellen to buy whatever bonds nobody wants. See, quantitative easing goes to treasuries. There's no quantitative easing program for Puerto Rican government bonds. If there were, then Puerto Rico wouldn't be having a problem right now. They can pretend everything was great, just like America is pretending everything is great. But this is a warning sign. People are ignoring it, just like they ignored the subprime problem. They said, hey, don't worry about the mortgage market. It's just subprime. It's contained. You know, oh, it's just contained to Puerto Rico. It's contained to Greece. No, it's not. This is a debt problem, and we have the problem bigger than anybody. It's just that people are oblivious to it, and they think that we're immune to it because we can print money. But printing money is going to be our downfall, and it's why we're going to have so much inflation and why you know people you know need to be doing to protect themselves. As far as uh, China is concerned, look, China is slowing down too, but the U.S. economy is slowing down even faster. You know, look at U.S. GDP in the second quarter. We just got that reported. It was 2.3 percent. That's about half of what it was in the second quarter of last year. So our, our, you know, our economy is rapidly decelerating. The whole first half of uh, 2015 is 1.45%. And the second half could be even lower than that. So yes, you know, uh, China is slowing down from 100 miles an hour to 70 miles an hour. And we're slowing down from 30 miles an hour to 15. You know, and, you know, we're getting ready to go into reverse. So I'm much more worried about the economic slowdown in the U.S. than I'm worried about what's going on in China. But, yeah, China does have problems. And I think a lot of those problems are made in America. You know, we buy all these products made in China. Well, they get all their problems made over here. A lot of it is a byproduct of them keeping their currency too low and all the malinvestments and bubbles that flow from having interest rates too low. Well, of course, you know, we've done a bigger problem here. But when China finally uh, allows their currency to rise, and I think they're doing that, I think they're preparing for, for that. They just announced, you know, their gold holdings uh, much lower than I would estimate. But again, I think they did this after lying about it for seven years. They pretended they weren't buying any gold. Now they fessed up. But I think they're still lying. I think they, they wanted to at least admit that they bought some gold, but they didn't want to tell everybody how much. And now people think, oh, see, they're not buying as much gold as we thought. And that made the price go down. And this is great for the Chinese because now they can buy even more. And this repatriation thing, too, I find quite fascinating because it's the kind of stuff that you think would be like a four alarm fire for the mainstream media that a lot of governments, particularly in Europe, are demanding their gold back. 
yeah. that seems quite important to me. Uh, I don't know if it's too complicated to explain through the mainstream media. I don't know, because maybe yeah. if the gold changed its gender and had a reality show or something, maybe mm -hmm. uh, we'd hear more about it. But uh, w what are the indications that people should be taking from this clawback of gold from the European governments and other governments as well? Well, again, it's a lack of trust, not a lack of trust in gold, but a lack of trust in the institutions that are claiming to be holding on to it for you. Because what if your gold depository doesn't actually have the gold that it's holding for you? What if it's actually been loaned out to short sellers who have sold it onto the market and they don't have it? And, and so that's the risk. And what if the gold isn't actually there? You know, people think they own gold, but they don't own it. And of course, if you thought you own it and then you find out you don't, and then you have to go back and buy it again because the gold you thought you had, you no longer own, where's the price going to go? Right. If people who have to go back and buy the gold and if the gold's not there, because maybe the people who do own it don't want to sell it. See, that's going to be the thing that happens right now. There's all these speculators that want to sell gold. Right. And they're shorting all this gold that they don't own. And in many cases, they're selling it to other speculators who have no intention of actually buying it. So you have all this paper gold trading around, but there's no actually gold there. Meanwhile, there's a lot of demand for real physical gold and silver. That demand is increasing as the price is going down. But at some point, there is going to be a rush to buy real gold, and it's not there. Yeah, if you want to buy gold from somebody who doesn't have it and can't deliver it, there's a huge supply of people willing to short it to you. Right? If you actually want gold that you can have in your hands, there's not that much of it around. And I believe that the people who have it aren't going to sell it. My clients and other people who have been buying gold, you know, if gold goes to 1500 tomorrow, they're not selling any. You know, so where are I'm the people selling. who need? Yeah, where are the I'm people holding who need on to it? They'll dig it. I hope to be buried <laughs> with this gold. I mean, I hold on to it like grim death. I mean, like, there's almost nothing that could make me part with it because whenever you have that urge to sell, it's because you think things are getting worse. And if we're right and things get a lot worse, you want to hold on to your gold to the last possible minute. Use it to buy your life in the desert of the future. I don't know, but uh, yeah, hang on to it. Is, is sort of my suggestion for people. Yeah. And as I said, it, it is, you know, eventually we're going to use our gold eventually. You know, when we do have a monetary crisis, a dollar crisis, I mean, we, it might be the only thing that people will accept in payment for goods and services. But certainly under normal circumstances, just a market appreciation is not going to tempt any selling, especially when the people who have been buying physical gold want more. They want more than they have, which is why I wanted to, you know, announce we got a special going on in these silver, half ounce silver rounds at Shift Gold. We were able to get a number of these things and we're going to run out by the end of the week, but we're selling them at an introductory rate. You can't find silver rounds. These are half ounce rounds cheaper anywhere online. The only problem is I don't know how much longer we're going to have them. We are limiting the number. Uh, that will allow each individual. It's kind of like a goodwill kind of gesture. Uh, but you know, we're going to run out of them by, by the end of the week. There's like a shortage now in a lot of the products that we sell in the physical world, right? To shift gold, the clients, they don't want paper. They want the actual gold or silver delivered into their doorstep so they can have it in their hands. And it's getting harder and harder to come by that. Even junk silver, which are, you know, dimes, quarters, half dollars, minted before 1965, you know, you're, we're having a hard time getting those. And, you know, you're all of a sudden you're, you're having to wait a long time to get delivery because the supply is just not there. Right, right. Now, as far as all this quantitative easing and why it's not translating into even more inflation than people are seeing, the, the, the image that I have and I work in analogies, so forgive me for the flourish, but um, the, the analogy that I have is I sort of think of a giant sponge and a pitcher of water being poured into the giant sponge. It doesn't immediately flood, like you just pour it on the ground, you know, you're up to your ankles in water. You pour it into this giant sponge and it's just, it doesn't immediately, but the effect is still going to be there. And mm -hmm. it seems to me like uh, the phrase you've used is we're exporting our inflation. And we're all, of course, deferring our inflation by having a bunch of treasuries bought, which is just future liabilities. Mm -hmm. Is that a reasonable way for people to sort of understand why we've not had the same proportion of inflation as we have had of money printing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, you know, you have to look at where the money is going and kind of follow the flows. You know, a lot of this new money is being introduced through the banking system and, and it, through Wall Street. And if you want to look at stock prices, if you want to look at bond prices, if you want to look at high end real estate prices, I mean, the average house that the average guy is going to look in, you know, that for house, house is not going up. But, you know, these multi million dollar homes or very expensive condos in major cities, right? They're going way up.
right? Uh, and you look at anything that wealthy people buy, look at, you know, fine art, you know, uh, collectible type art, the great masters, look at collectible cars, you know, antique rare cars. I mean, prices have been going through the roof. So the, the people who have been getting all this money, they're spending it. And the, and the prices of things they're buying are going up. So that is happening. And if you see, again, asset prices going up as a result of money printing, see, stock prices aren't going up because companies are more profitable. They're not earning more money, right? Their, their stocks are just more expensive because more money is being printed and it's being used to buy them. Or the companies themselves are using that cheap money to buy back their own stocks. So they're bidding up the price. So you have the the, the inflation manifesting itself in financial assets. But meanwhile, it is in the real economy. Rents are rising at their fastest pace in years. Uh, utilities are going up. Your, your cable bill, uh, grocery bills are going up. I mean, look at the price of a hamburger, you know, uh, you know, things are getting more expensive. The government doesn't want to acknowledge that. Look at healthcare costs, uh, insurance premiums, whether it's health insurance or, you know, your auto insurance going up or, you know, uh, prices are rising. Um, the government just doesn't accurately report that. But the fact that the dollar has been so strong over the last few years, that's brought down oil prices, other commodity prices. That's helping to uh, keep inflation in check. But, you know, inflation is being exported because the rest of the world isn't seeing those big price declines that Americans are seeing. Meanwhile, goods are still flowing in. Our trade deficit is still enormous. And so the dynamic there is we print money and we ship it abroad. And so now the world has our money and then they p produce products and they send them here. So we get their stuff and they get our paper. And so the more stuff pushes down the price, right? There's more supply of stuff, so it keeps the price down. And the rest of the world has less stuff because they send it to us, but they have more paper floating around. And so mm. they end up with higher prices. We get lower prices, so we're able to export a lot of that inflation. But one of these days, when the world gets tired of holding on to all that paper and they actually want to spend it, right? Then all of a sudden it comes back and what are they going to buy? Well, whatever they buy is going to get more expensive. And I'm not sure what they're going to buy because we're not producing the consumer goods uh, that, 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 that we buy from them. So one of these days that this inflation is going to come back, you know, like a tsunami and, you know, and wash up on our shores and we're going to drown in it. But meanwhile, you know, it, it, you got to protect yourself from it now. And all these governments, they're all telling us here, oh, we got nothing to worry about. There's no inflation. They're printing all this money. And somehow there's no inflation when that is the definition of inflation. And then they make fun of people like me for saying, oh, Peter Schiff was warning that there was inflation. And look, there's none. He was totally wrong. You've got nothing to worry about. In fact, the politicians are trying to tell us that not only don't we have inflation, that we don't have enough inflation, that inflation is so low that we should try to get more of it, that prices aren't rising fast enough, that we need prices to go up even faster, which would be, you know, shock the average American who's already struggling, you know, with a rising cost of living to find out that our leaders are losing sleep, worrying how to make the cost of living go up even faster because they don't think uh, things are expensive enough. Yeah. Now, don't don't you wish or, or long for the good old days of the mid two thousands when there was only one crash in in general to worry about, which was the housing crash, perhaps to some degree the financial crash. It seems like, and I'm I'm trying not to be sort of paranoid about this stuff, Peter, but it seems like everywhere I look, I see a bubble. Like we just did, um, we did China, we did Puerto Rico, we did something on the um, mm -hmm. uh, student debt, uh, a trillion dollar liability in the student debt crisis, it's 1. and so 4 on. One point four trillion now. It's already one point four. That's how fast it's growing. Yeah, <laughs> man. <laughs> so it seems like, uh, and here in Canada, I mean, it seems to me that we've got kind of a housing bubble. I mean, just look at the prices are mad. And of course, if the Chinese economy tanks, particularly out on the West Coast, it means the prices, the cash driven prices for high end homes is going to collapse uh, because the Chinese are buying a lot of homes, uh, getting their money out of China, probably because they know what's coming. Um, if you sort of had to rank order where, where you think the bubbles are going to be hitting us from, what would you, where would your panic list be? Well, you know, I think the biggest bubble is in the dollar itself. You know, the dollar, uh, I think is, you know, probably at the, at the foundation of the bubbles. Cause, but ultimately, you know, that's going to be the one I think that pops first. Because in order for the central bank to maintain the bubbles in the stock market, in the real estate market, right? Uh, they're going to have to sacrifice the dollar. 
because if they're ultimately they have to print dollars to buy up bonds to prevent interest rates from rising. They have to print more dollars to fund another round of quantitative easing. If the government's going to keep on spending and it doesn't want to raise taxes to pay for the spending because it really can't get blood from a stone at this point, you know, where's the money going to come from in order to pay off all the government obligations, whether it's to uh, people on Social Security, uh, people on Medicare, uh, you know, people who are retired, you know, collecting a government paycheck bondholders, you know, de, you know, defaulted student loans, defaulted home mortgages, all that money is going to have to be created out of thin air by the Fed. And, and so ultimately, the air is going to have to come out of the dollar bubble. And I think ultimately, when the dollar really goes into free fall, and the Federal Reserve is forced to do something about it, like Russia, you know, they had to raise interest rates to 17%, I think, earlier this year to stop the ruble from collapsing. When we're backed into a wall, into a corner like that, and we have to do something, just like Paul Volcker had to jack interest rates up to 20% in 1980 to stop a dollar crisis from, you know, snowballing. That's when all the other bubbles are going to prick, when the Fed is finally forced to raise rates, because then a whole an economy that's built on cheap credit, when you yank that cheap credit away, when you like pull it out from under like a rug, it's going to, you know, you're going to, it's going to fall over because all of a sudden rates are going to skyrocket and, and then that, that's it. Everything is going to implode. And it seems like they're out of arrows in their quiver. I mean, it seems like that there's always been this, uh, oh, you can play with the interest rates with this, you can make like that, that. But it seems to me like they can't lower their interest rates below zero. You can't pay people to take. I mean, that's just too obvious. Mm. I don't see how they can print a whole lot more money. I don't see how the trade deficit, like it seems like they're kind of out of these Keynesian stimulus options for whenever the next thing hits. I don't know that oh, there's yeah. going to be a I lot mean, of smoke and it. mirrors. Well, the next thing is going to be an overdose on Keynesian stimulus, and it's going to kill us. But when the stock market bubble burst in 2001, whatever, Greenspan lowered interest rates to 1%. They, they kept them there for about a year and a half. And then the economy was recovering, so they slowly raised them back up. And by the time the financial crisis hit, you know, rates were back over 5%, right? The Fed reloaded the gun and had all those bullets back in there. And then, of course, the minute the market collapsed, they, they used it like a machine gun, right? Because they shot all, they got down to zero so quickly, they, they, the clip was empty. But this has been a recovery, supposedly. They tell us we've had this really great recovery, yet during the entirety of this seven-year recovery, they haven't even raised rates once. You know, and if the next recession starts, let's say, next year or maybe at the end of this year and it starts and they're still at zero what is their option what is their policy prescription well we know what it is qe4 because that's all they've got right they're going to do another round of qe but the message it should send is that we've now re reached a point where we we can never raise interest rates because if we couldn't raise interest rates during the recovery, obviously we can't raise them during the next recession. And since the next recession will be worse than the even than the last recession, how are they going to ever be able to raise rates again? See, the thing that's keeping the dollar up is the anticipation of higher rates, the belief that this monetary policy was temporary, that we're going to normalize rates, that the Fed is going to shrink its balance sheet. Well, from the very beginning, I said this is impossible. We are in a monetary roach motel. You cannot check out from 0% rates without collapsing the bubble that 0% rates inflated. In fact, this economy is so addicted to cheap money, you can't even take away the QE. That's why I know they're going to do QE4. It's the same reason they did QE3. They did. They stopped QE2. Everybody thought they were done. I knew that wasn't the case. I knew that they would do QE3 eventually because I knew QE2 didn't work. And not only didn't it work, it made the problems they were trying to solve worse, which is why they did QE3. And now the problems are even worse after QE3 than before they started it, which means the solution is QE4. And that probably will be the last round. Now, <laughs> let's switch gears for a sec because you had uh, you had a a good run. I mean, well, okay, you're a very successful businessman, and you took a good run at uh, at politics. Hmm. I'm just wondering if there's someone else in the media we can think of who might <laughs> be along those lines. I don't know if you've been following the Donald, but um, what are your thoughts on his candidacy? I, I have been quite surprised at the degree of traction he's got. You know, you always forget about the silent majority when all you read is the media. You think everyone's lefty. And then someone like Donald Trump comes along and you remember that there's this whale under the water that sometimes surfaces in American politics. Uh, and he seems to be really tapping into that. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, on his candidacy? Yeah, you know, it doesn't surprise me that he is as popular as he is. And again, it just shows you that things are a lot worse than people think. Because 
you know, he's really like the the, the none of the above. I mean, he's like voting because, <laughs> you know, for no, none of the candidates. Right. And none of the above would probably do pretty well. I always thought if I was going to run for office, I should that should be my name. None of the above. <laughs> and, you know, maybe maybe I maybe I could win. But, you know, it's basically people are fed up. They know the economy is getting worse uh, and they don't think that the Democrats or the Republicans are going to do anything about it you know, because they, they're both to blame for the mess that we're in. And a guy like Donald Trump, you know, articulates a lot of our problems. I mean, a lot of the things that Donald Trump says are true. They're not all true, but some of them are true. And enough of it is true that people can identify with it. And at least they look at the guy and he's, you know, he's unapologetic about his wealth. And they're tired of these phony hypocrites like Hillary Clinton trying to talk about uh, how the rich people are trying to do this. Meanwhile, she's as rich as anybody and she's living a pretty high lifestyle. Yet she's trying to identify with average guys. At least Donald Trump is 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 telling it like it is. Look, I'm rich. I don't apologize for it. And I and you know, I don't want to pay taxes. I pay as little as possible. And he's proud of that. And he speaks his mind. And people are like, yeah, you know, this is a difference. This is not like voting for one of these other Republicans. Now I would I wish people would vote more Rand Paul. I wish Rand could get some of the disgruntled voters that are going to Trump. Uh, by 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 actually showing that he's a lot different than a mainstream Republican. And he really is a, a move in a different direction. But he hasn't been able to capture that kind of excitement uh, the way Donald Trump has. And, you know, he you know, he, he's going to get a lot of votes in the Republican primary. He, he'd probably get votes even if he ran in the Democratic primary um, because people are fed up. It's the, the economy is not as strong as people think. So they're looking for anything. They're grasping for straws. And, you know, they see Donald Trump. At least he's different. You know, at least he's saying things that other candidates aren't saying. And people think he's honest. People know that, you know, he's not doing an opinion poll. You know, he's just saying what he thinks. And, you know, and people like that. And I think, you know, he's got some bad scapegoats, you know, to blame things on on immigrants. But I know a lot of people in the Republican Party want to blame a lot of these problems on immigration. And I think that's wrong. That's not the problem. Clamping down on illegal immigration isn't going to solve our problems. They're more of a scapegoat for problems that are being caused by government. Now, Donald Trump talks a lot about the trade deficit and how bad it is. And he's right. It's a disaster. But he can't solve it by hiring better negotiators. That's not the problem. A better negotiator with Mexico or China isn't going to solve our problem. Our trade deficit is big because our businesses have collapsed. Our factories are gone. We're having to deal with regulations and taxes that the Chinese, our Chinese competitors, or even our Mexican competitors aren't having to deal with. So we have too much government. And so that's what he needs to do. He doesn't need to change our negotiators. We need to eliminate all these regulations and taxes. So we don't have to worry about what mistakes our negotiators want. Let's just have free trade. There's nothing to negotiate there. Yeah, I would be uh, curious as well if he's ever going to start talking about monetary policy. Uh, I mean, I certainly think he's got the IQ points to to grasp it. and, And maybe he could find a way to communicate it to people. I don't know, using juggling balls or <laughs> fire hoses that people try and drink yeah. from. I don't. I, he's a showman, and he's got you know what he has. I think that Rand Paul doesn't have as much of is a sort of larger than life, half clown, half compelling, half mm. always fascinating kind of persona. He's a larger than life persona, and uh, I think Rand yeah. Paul is uh, a bit more cautious that way. But I mean, uh, everybody knows who he is, right? I mean, yeah. he has a high name recognition, and look, you know, I mean, he's nece- he's not necessarily self made in that he, you know, he did get off to a good start because his, he inherited money from his father. But he certainly did a lot on his own. There are a lot of people. Look, look at Paris Hilton, right? There are a lot of people who inherit money and they just blow it. They don't. They don't contribute anything to society. They don't grow a business. They don't hire anybody. They just spend daddy's money. And 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 he didn't do that. I mean, he you know he he inherited a fortune and turned it into a much larger fortune. Um, but he's he's not a politician. That's for you know that's what people want. I mean, he you know people say, oh, you don't have the you know the experience to be president. Well, what 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 kind of experience do the other candidates? have. So they were they were in Congress. I mean, what kind of experience is that? What did they actually do? I mean, he actually, you know, has a resume where he actually did real things. He didn't just win elections. I mean, what you know, what does that mean? You know, yes, I'm qualified to be president because I've I've won other elections to to lower offices. I mean, you know, big deal. I mean, you know, we've we've elected career politicians, you know, for generations and look at the mess the country is in. You know, so maybe, hey, let's try somebody, you know, 
Ross Perot tried to tap into that, and he almost, you know, he didn't do that bad in a three-way race. And if he hadn't dropped out and got back in again, but, you know, you know, he was kind of a weird guy, Ross Perot. And, I mean, uh, Donald Trump is a much stronger personality than Ross Perot and his charts and his let's get grandma out and get under the hood and fix the engine, whatever. I mean, a lot of the stuff that, that Donald Trump says, I mean, it, it's, it's really strong stuff. And people might say, you know what, let's take a shot. I can't be any worse. You know, <laughs> I think there's this desperation, too, because he can run without donations. There, I think there, I mean, everybody kind of gets that, you know, if, it, the old joke being that if you put the stickers on congressmen the way you put on NASCARs, you wouldn't be able to see them. They're so buried mm -hmm. in logos. And everyone who donates gets their uh, special favors and the average taxpayer just gets the bill. I think people are kind of really hungry for a candidate who doesn't need to take people's money just, just to see if that is going to affect the political process at all. Yeah, although I do think if he's going to, if he actually got the Republican nomination, I mean, I'll, he would need money because I don't know that he's willing to spend a billion dollars. I don't know how much he's actually liquid for. You know, a lot of his net worth is businesses and properties. And, you know, you don't know, you know, because to, to run in a primary, it's not as expensive. But a general election against a well-funded Democratic machine, he's going to need contributions. I don't think that I don't think he can do this whole thing. I don't think he's I don't think he's that rich. Uh, mm -hmm. He's going to need he's going to need support. But he certainly, you know, isn't for sale. You don't have the idea that, you know, he's doing this for the money. Now, he could be doing it for his ego because we know he has a big ego and he pretty much has any, everything he wants. Uh, so the White House is generally something that, you know, there's a lot of power and prestige and perks that go with being the president. And so, you know, it's hard to put a price tag on that. But that's certainly something that, you know, a billionaire just can't buy, you know. You know, all the money you have, you're not going to be treated. President Obama, with his entourage, you know, the way he travels, the way he's treated, you know, no billionaire really could probably match that experience, you know, right? Because I don't know how much money you would have to have. I don't know if any king of any country had ever, you know, have has such a huge, you know, court at their disposal. You know, all the people that are there that are working for them uh, that you have. So it's, it's, it's probably a very unique experience. There's only a handful of people that are alive today that have experienced that. So, yeah. you know, it could be something that, you know, a lot of people would want, uh, you know. Now, I don't know if you followed this story. Dan Price, uh, he was CEO of a Seattle-based Gravity Payments. He's the guy, he made <laughs> national news a couple of months ago. I, you probably have followed this. In the, of course, this was going to happen next. I mean, uh, this is like reading <laughs> Atlas Shrugged for the fourth time, watching this guy's business plan unfold. But he's the guy who said, uh, everybody gets $70,000. That's the minimum wage. And it's, I think it was a fixed wage for all his employees or something like that. And everyone was like, wow, great. <laughs> Somebody with long hair and a hippie do scruffy beard can somehow repeal the laws of economics. Uh, have you seen this uh, play out and where he's at now? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I just put in uh, an article. I posted an article on my Facebook page and I've got 250,000 views already. I mean, that's a lot of views just for an article. So people are interested in this topic. But I, I talked about this guy on my podcast. You know, I used to do the radio show and now I just do this podcast. And I did one on this guy because I predicted that this whole company would fail eventually and all his employees were going to lose their jobs. So instead of making, they used to make 40,000 and then they got a bump to 70. I said, look, they're going to go down to zero. And I hope they don't, you know, go out and buy a new car or run up their credit card debts because they're expecting to earn $70,000 because this business model is unsustainable. You know, it's really like a socialist from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Cause he says, all my people need $70,000 a year. So I'm going to pay them what they need, regardless of their ability, regardless of their productivity. And th it destroyed the whole thing. And I knew that, you know, look, how is he going to succeed? I mean, he's not going to be able to do this. And, you know, some of the higher, uh, paid people now left. Uh, and of course, you get inundated by job applicants. All the people that can only do $25,000, dollars $40,000 worth of work, all of a sudden they all want to work for you because you're overpaying. But if you're overpaying relative to your competitors, then how are you going to stay in business if you're overpaying? You're, just, you're not going to be price competitive. Uh, and meanwhile, he gave up his entire income. He was making a million dollars a year. 
Now he's not even making nothing. He had to rent out his house because he can't even afford to live there. I mean, where is the return for him? He's the entrepreneur. He took all the risk. I mean, what's you can't work for nothing. Meanwhile, his brother, who was his partner, I guess, sued him because he gave away all his brother's money. I mean, his brother invested in this business, not so he can give out all the money to the employees. They didn't invest in the business. He just decided to, to splurge because he had some idea of some, you know, utopian, you know, world where everybody earns seventy thousand dollars an hour. Meanwhile, this whole business is going to fail. And so you have a viable business going under. Customers who used to benefit from the services are now going to have to buy their services someplace else, presumably at a higher price or not as good a value as they got before. And all the jobs that were there are going to be destroyed. The people that were making 100000 a year aren't, have lost their jobs. And the people who were making 40000 a year, not only did they lose their jobs, but they lost their chance to one day progress to earn $70,000 a year. You know, hey, they thought they had it for nothing. Hey, why do I have to increase my skills? Why do I have to work harder? I'm just getting $70,000 a year for doing the same work when I was doing for you. Know, it, the whole thing didn't work, but the liberal media was fawning all over this guy. They were putting him up. Hey, this is what everybody should be. This is the perfect ideal CEO. Why doesn't every CEO do what he did? Well, if every CEO did, be, did what he did, then all the companies would be broke, just like his. So what good would that be? Well, it's so sad because it, it makes people feel so passive if they feel that their salary has kind of nothing to do with them and it's, it's the whim of whoever got power. You know, it's just, well, if this guy likes me, he'll just give me more money. But I keep telling my listeners as an entrepreneur myself, if you want to make more money, provide more value. You have to up your skills. I mean, I can go onto a movie set and demand $20 million to star in the movie, but nobody's going to pay me because I ain't Brad Pitt. You know, Brad Pitt can open a movie. He can make movies make money. So just provide more value and the marketplace will inevitably reflect that. Yeah, you know, Hollywood is a perfect example. I mean, you get what you're worth. I mean, yeah. And look at all the pay disparity. I mean, should we force uh, motion picture uh, producers to pay all the actors the same? Should they not uh, take these factors into consideration? Should it just be equal pay for equal work? I mean, you know, because acting is acting. I mean, so if 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 Brad Pitt has a co-star who has the same number of lines, why shouldn't he get the same pay? It's the same work, right? Why don't they always? No, because they're, the employer is looking at the value added. How much am I going to earn if I hire this guy? And if I have Brad Pitt starring in my movie, I'm going to have a lot more than if I have Stefan Molyneux. And so even if Stefan is just as good an actor, maybe, and can read the lines just as well, you know, I can't, I can't, have, I can't have a $50 million action movie starring Stefan because I'm going to lose a bunch of money. I got to put Tom Cruise, I got to put Brad Pitt in there, even if I got to pay him $25 million. That's what I got to do. You know, plus, uh, <laughs> sometimes I wake up with a bit of a kink in my neck. So those action scenes, you know, they can be a little stiff. So, oh, you no, know, those guys, get, what's it? Mission, I mean, Tom Cruise just like a, did another Mission Impossible. To me, being over 50 and starring in an action movie is Mission Impossible. Good well, yeah, on you, well, man. He's, he's doing another Top Gun. He's going to be back in is a fighter really? pilot. But, you know, there's wow. no 50 year old women doing these movies. I mean, all the actresses that were popular when I was in my 20s, none of them are working. But Kelly the actresses, in the, the first same one, guys. I don't even know what she's done for the last 20 years. Right. But the same guys that were acting in movies when I was in my 20s, they're acting. There's age discrimination in Hollywood. There's sex discrimination. I mean, they pay the women a lot less than they pay the men. But no one cares because they, the free market works there and no one criticizes it. But somehow these same people want to criticize the free market when it happens in any other industry. The people producing movies aren't sexist. They're not discriminating against, you know, women. They're just looking at the bottom line. And for some reason, the people buying tickets to movies, they want they want these big action stars and they want their women younger and prettier. That's what they want. They don't want 50 year old women. Right. They want 20 year old women, but they don't mind 50 year old guys. And the thing is, these 50 year old guys, they don't even look 50. I, you know, I talked to my son, you know, we're watching like these. I said, you, you realize that he's my age, like Tom Cruise and, and Brad Pitt. Oh, yeah. They're the same age as me. They like they look like they're half my age. But I can only assume that they, they sleep in vats of formaldehyde or something like that. Or, you know, I, I have to occasionally get some work done that doesn't involve doing sit-ups hanging like a bat from a monkey bar or something. So, you know, they must work really hard to, to stay looking that good. So more power to them. I mean, they should get paid yeah. that. Yeah, but I guess maybe it just doesn't work as well for women. But you know, the bottom line 
is that it's a free market. And yeah, if you know, you can't just demand, you know, the minimum wage, people think, oh, I want $15 minimum wage, as if your boss is going to be required to pay you $15 an hour, even though your productivity is, is nine. And no, the minimum wage doesn't force your boss to pay you anything. All it does is force him to choose between paying you $15 or firing you. And unfortunately for a lot of people, he's going to choose the latter. You know, that's what's going to happen. Now, for the people who don't get fired, OK, maybe you're going to benefit, but it's going to be at the expense of everybody else who is. And meanwhile, your business, the business that's employing you is going to be less efficient, uh, even if it has to you know, use machines to do the work of the labor that it fired, because if that was more efficient, it would have done that anyway. It, it just waited till the government forced them to do it. So people are going to pay higher prices. So all you're going to get from a higher minimum wage is fewer job opportunities and higher prices and a lower standard of living in general for, for society. Oh, man, if there's one myth I mean, it's all, it changes every day. But today, Peter, the one myth that I would really like for people to, to, to disabuse themselves of is this myth or this fantasy that people in power are just sitting on piles of gold. Like they just <laughs> have masses and masses of gold. Like because people say, well, the government can pay for this. And it's like, the go- well, first of all, because the government has no money at all. They just flow through for taxes, debt and, and, and counterfeiting. But your boss is not – sitting on massive piles of gold and if he pays you more he just takes a little bit out of his basement full of like smog like <laughs> treasure right the, the the customers are paying your salary and so yeah. the the boss is just organizing the customers to pay your salary that's that's basically all he's doing and so if you want a higher salary you have to accept it's not going to come out of your boss's profit it's not going to come out of his money it's going to come out of the customers and so how is your job going to do if you have to double the price of whatever it is you're paying for and even if your job does survive as you point out you're going to end up paying a lot more so you can get $15 more it's the purchasing power that counts not the mass the number and if inflation is going up because of higher minimum wages you don't end up with more to buy. What most people don't understand is the companies that pay minimum wage, because most U.S. employers don't have any employees at minimum wage, right? They don't hire those type of workers. They don't provide the entry-level jobs. If you look at the average businessman who is employing, you know, young people, teenagers, young adults in entry-level jobs, they themselves are not making that much money. I mean, you own a restaurant, Right. How much do you think a restaurant owner is making? Seventy five thousand, one hundred thousand dollars a year. These guys aren't rich. Right. And they might employ 20 or 30 people. You force this restaurateur to give all those people a raise fifty dollars an hour. He has no profit. It's gone. All of his profits is gone. So now he's got to figure out how to stay in business. Either he has to jack up his prices and hope that he doesn't lose too much business or he's got to figure out how to, you know, how to, you know, not pay as many people, not have as many people. Can I automate? Can I have self-serve? Can I have machines? Because, you know, these guys aren't employing the people that are making, you know, the hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year. They're employing uh, the low skill guys. And I see a lot of businesses that want to say, oh, yeah, we need a higher minimum wage, but they don't have anybody that works. I don't have a single worker. Not that I'm a really big company. I don't have one worker that makes uh, minimum wage. I don't even think I have anybody that makes $15 an hour. Why? Because I can't find anybody to do the work that I need who will do it that cheaply. Believe me, if I could, I would hire that person. That's what capitalism is about. It's about, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to get the best deal you can. I mean, everybody does that. If you wanted to hire a plumber to fix your, your, uh, your, your sink, you would call two or three plumbers and you take the lowest price. I mean, you're going to hire the guy who's going to do the work for the least amount of money. That's what everybody wants to do. But I mean, if the guy's not competent, you can't hire him, right? I have to find people competent enough to do what I want. And those people demand more than the minimum wage. But there are people, if you're just looking for somebody to take an order, you know, uh, behind a win, anybody can do that. You can take a, a kid out of high school, a 16 year old, talk to him for 15 minutes and they'll be able to do it. So obviously you don't have to pay a lot of money to hire somebody like that. But, you know, those are very important jobs in a person's life because that's what gets them on the path. That's where they learn responsibility. They learn about business. They learn about customer service. They learn all sorts of things that are valuable. In fact, most young people, you know, they should pay to have those jobs. The fact that they're even getting paid is the icing on the cake because what they're getting is experience that has much more value than their minimum wage paychecks. And also, I mean, from my experience uh, starting off, uh, 
you you have the worst bosses in your early jobs because all the competent <laughs> bosses aren't managing minimum wage people. Like competent bosses, really great bosses, they're managing professionals, they're managing multinationals, they're doing so. It's all the really cheese eating, neck beard, mouth breathing dunder bosses who are down there at the lower <laughs> levels. And if you can deal with them, every boss. I say this to my listeners sometimes who are complaining about bosses when they're starting out. Every boss you have after your first boss will be a dream come true. It's, it gets way easier, and if you can run that gauntlet yeah. at the beginning beginning, you can get, you can, no way you can't go in life. And I can tell you this too. I know that a lot of people that do start off working, let's say in a, in a fast food franchise that start at the bottom, a lot of these guys go on to owning their own franchises because they learn the business from the ground up. They stay with it. They get promoted. They do become the manager of the restaurant. And eventually, you know, they, they, they break out on their own and they, and they pick up their own franchise. This is what happens. I mean, a lot of these guys don't have college degrees. They don't even have high school degrees, but they are running businesses. But the only reason they have the skills to run those businesses is because they've worked in those businesses their whole lives. They've learned the business from the ground up. And a lot of times you can't learn those skills in school. You have to be in, in the business world to learn how to run one of those restaurants, to, to learn all the nuances of business. But you take away those entry level jobs and you take away those future entrepreneurs. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, there's only two major ways to increase salaries uh, as a whole. And we, of course, we used to see this up until the 90s when this all began to crater. Uh, number one, of course, people have to have more schools. I think that one of the reasons why governments want to pump up minimum wage is they basically want to hide how unbelievably unskilled people are when they come out of 12 years of government education. I mean, they're worthless in the marketplace as a whole. So they don't want, if, if the wages fell to what governments were producing and the value they had, I doubt people could, you know, get bus fare to their jobs. So they want to cover that up. And the second thing, of course, to raise wages, as you pointed out, I mean, just increase competition for workers, you know, get more businesses started, uh, lower barriers to entry, like a third of Americans need government permission to do their job. That's insane. Maybe you're working in a nuclear factory, but hairdressing, really? Come on. I mean, you're not going to get someone's ear off if you don't have a license so lower barriers to entry yeah yeah if you're if you want if you want to sell your labor to somebody yeah you want as many people bidding for it as possible so the government has to pursue business friendly policies make it as easy as possible for people uh, to hire people to start businesses but we're doing the opposite we're basically targeting employers for mass discrimination as far as uh, fines and lawsuits and taxes we, we create all sorts of reasons for people not to want to hire people. You know, we're making it very risky to hire. So, you know, it's no wonder that these jobs aren't here. But, you know, one of the funniest things I remember hearing about college and minimum wage is I remember an argument that said that we need to raise the minimum wage because if we don't raise the minimum wage, how do we expect our college grads to repay their loans? Right. <laughs> oh, we're, no. we're, 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 hope, we're sending kids to college to graduate and work at a minimum wage job. Because I would joke when I was a kid, what they always used to say was, you know, you better go to college because if you don't go to college, you're going to end up, you know, as a fry cook at McDonald's. Right now, it's a totally different refrain. Now we're saying, hey, if you want to land a plum job at McDonald's, you better borrow a lot of money and go to college. You know, yeah. because, you know, because you need a college degree now to get those jobs. I mean, this is ridiculous, and people can't even, you know, put two and two together to see the absurdity of this situation. Now, I wonder if we could uh, end up with, I've, I've been curious about if you could, you know, crawl into the ear of whoever's going to end up being the president next, right? I mean, uh, and, and you could give them sort of a top two or three things that you'd really like to see happen in the economy. I mean, you're a dad, I'm a dad, of course, we really care what kind of world our kids can grow up in. And if there's a couple of things, because, you know, the, you know, prioritization is pretty key when you're a manager. What are the couple of things that you'd really wake up singing and dancing out of bed if, if these things were achieved by whoever's the next commander in chief? Well, look, I mean, there, there's there's a lot that needs to be done, but it's it's all basically the same, you know, part of the same prescription. And that is to reduce government at all possible levels as much as possible through, you know, getting rid of or dismantling agencies, departments, uh, programs, slashing government spending, you know, getting government 
people off the government payroll. I mean, we need to make the government as small as possible, recognizing that the government is a gigantic burden on the economy and the economy cannot grow when it's weighed down by that burden. And we have to recognize that a lot of promises have been made that can never be kept. And we need to level with that rather than pretending that we can keep them and printing the money. We have to admit that we're broke, kind of like Puerto Rico did. And we need to allow the country to solve the problems that the government created. You know, we certainly need an independent Federal Reserve. We got to stop uh, the zero percent interest rates. We got to let interest rates go up. We need more savings so we can have real capital investment. But we're going to have to live through a real gut wrenching downturn at this point because we're going to have to allow a restructuring as painful that restructuring is going to be just like anybody that's a drug addict. You know, my recommendation is not, you know, do even more drugs. It's you got to stop drugs, check yourself into a rehab, you know, go cold turkey. You need rehabilitation. You need to get your life back on track. Well, it's the same advice for the economy. We have to come off this monetary high. You know, we have to stop all this speculating and consumption and borrowing. And we have to go back to what our grandparents or great grandparents did, uh, what the founders of this country uh, established for us, a free market of, you know, sound money, limited government, the rugged individual, you know, savings, production. We can't, you know, be looking to create special privileges for people and try to protect everybody from discrimination or, you know, you know, everybody doesn't have a right to be treated, you know, equally or fairly. I mean, you got to make it on your own in this world. You gotta, you know, you gotta go out and, 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 and stake your own claim. And it doesn't matter who's discriminating against you. You just gotta overcome it. You know, you can't expect to be handed something on a silver platter and look for some government to make things fair for you or level some kind of playing field. You play on the field that's there and you do your best. And if you're born, if you, if you're not as smart as the next guy, you know, you're not as ambitious or, you know, you have to figure out how to overcome. You got to play the hand that you're dealt, right? That's how Roosevelt said, look, I'm going to give everybody a new deal. There is no new deal. You play the cards that you're dealt and you play them as best you can. And that's, and, th- and that's the way you're going to have, you know, the most prosperity. You know, my grandparents came here, right? All four of my grandparents came to America from Europe. If they wanted big government, they could have stayed in Europe, but they came here. We had no welfare. We had no social security. We had no minimum wage. We had no Medicare. We had no income tax either. We didn't have anything. Uh, and there was no anti-discrimination laws. Your boss can fire you for whatever reason you wanted. He didn't like, he didn't like the way you look. He didn't like what sex you were. He didn't like how old. It was whatever reason he wanted to fire you. You know, you, you know, was it. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't sue him. All you could do is get another job. But you know what? They came here by the millions. You know, and then when they got here, it was so great. They got the rest of their relatives to come over, too, because what we had was freedom. Right. And when we have freedom, we have prosperity. We don't have that anymore. The government has taken away our freedom. We've sold our soul to the government devil because he's promised us protection. Oh, yeah. We're not going to let your boss discriminate against you. We're not going to let him fire you. And you know, so we've done all these things. And so now there's no more jobs. There's no more bosses. You know, there's no more opportunity because the freedom is gone. Yeah. And we got a terrible bad price for it, too, because we didn't get, even get stuff. We got a few trinkets and a massive debt. Now, for my listeners who are interested in uh, services, you mentioned earlier that you've got some, uh, some silver for sale. I know you work with gold as well. Um, what are the services, if my listeners want to poke more into what you can provide for them, what would you, uh, what would you suggest that you can yeah. provide for them? Well, first of all, sure. At my uh, metals company, Shift Gold, you know, I've got the, uh, the logo up there over my shoulder. Uh, you know, we sell physical gold and silver, uh, delivered to your house. You can, you know, have it in your possession. You know, there are a lot of firms that sell gold and silver. The problem is a lot of them have huge markups. These are the guys that advertise on cable television all the time. Avoid those companies uh, because, you know, the price that you have to pay uh, is outrageous relative to what you're actually buying. We have very, very good prices. We have very, very low markups over the actual uh, value of the gold and silver that you're buying. So that's a ship gold. If you've got a more substantial portfolio, you know, I don't recommend that people only own gold, I mean, owning gold to the exclusion of everything else. I think you want to have an investment portfolio. Uh, we invest in stocks and bonds around the world, mainly stocks. But I screen the com- countries. You know, I'm looking for countries that rank very high on the index of economic freedom because I believe freedom results in prosperity and profits for investors. I want to invest where there's freedom, not where there's government. So I'm looking for the countries that have the least amount of government, 
which again, you know, it's it's all about, you know, relative basis, because a lot of the countries have a lot of government. It's a question of degree these days. Uh, but the go- countries that have relatively less government, so they have fewer regulations, they have lower taxes, generally they have better balances of trade, they have surpluses instead of the deficits, their people have high savings rates instead of like Americans who are running up uh, big debts. So I look for more favorable macroeconomic fundamentals, and I look to own currencies that I think are going to rise substantially against the dollar. It happens happens to be a great time to be investing with me right now because the U.S. dollar has had this huge suckers rally as everybody is convinced that the Fed has saved us. They don't realize they just set us up, you know, for the worst crash yet. And this will be, I think, a currency crisis. So before that bubble bursts, you know, you can use those dollars to buy assets on sale in Switzerland and Singapore and New Zealand and places like that where we invest and buy some real good quality companies you know, for 20, 30 percent off from where they were a year or two ago, simply because the dollar's gone so up so much. But I don't think the dollar is going to, going to, you know, retain these gains. I think it's going to surrender all the gains and then some when the people who've been buying the dollar, the speculators, wake up to reality. And that reality is not a vibrant recovery with a tighter monetary policy. It's renewed recession and an even looser monetary policy than we had before with QE4. Yeah. yeah. So it's a good time. You go to europack.com, uh, shiftgold.com, and uh, shiftradio.com. As always, Peter, a real pleasure. And, uh, of course, thanks for, for sounding the free market uh, trumpets across the uh, human landscape because there's not too many people out there, particularly in the mainstream media, doing it. So I thank you for that. And thank you for doing the same thing because you're out there too. And I do listen to your podcasts and, uh, and I often enjoy them. I just don't have enough time to listen to as many as I'd like to, but, but I, li- I listen to some. Fair enough. All right. Thanks, Peter. We'll talk again soon. Take care. Bye.